anyone, really, really anyone could do a survey interview. However, good qualitative interviewing, good open interviewing is way more difficult. Why? Well, in a survey interview, you have the questions on your questionnaire. You have to know it by heart and you have to work a bit on rapport. Whereas in an open interview, you have to do that. But you also have to improvise a lot more because the questions are open, meaning the answers are open as well. And they go literally anywhere. Interviewees talk about anything. And what you have to do, the techniques you have to use are probing them in order to bring someone back on the topic or to ask more, more specific kind of information. And that's what probing is. Probing is a way to get to information. And how? Well, by responding to replies from the interviewee in order to get more broader, more specific, more personal um, and clearer information. So a probe is not per se a question. A probe could be a lot more than that. And probing is not. What is it not? Well, probing is not posing as many questions as possible within a minute. So probing is not asking, what did you do today? Shopping with Nelly and, and yesterday, nothing special, but and last week, I wasn't finished yet. So probing is not that. Probing is not that. What is probing then? Well, probing, in probing, you have to give someone the opportunity to wander about. And this type of research, this type of interview, the walking interview or the go along interview is very popular recently. Why? Because it's one way of giving someone the opportunity to talk freely, to walk around, to dance a little bit and to talk, to talk freely. And so why don't you need to probe directly? Well, to give someone space, opportunity. And we could use the model of Tour and Go, which was originally designed for more survey interviews. But we could also use it for open interviews. And an interviewee should be given the opportunity to interpret the question first. As an interviewer, you pose the question and the interviewee has to think. What does this mean? What is this question? And then has to look for the answer. And often I visualize it as if you have to look in different drawers in order to find the answer. So process the demand. Is it something from the heart, from the brain, from my past? What is it? What does the interviewer want, is an interviewee thinking. And then judge the answer. Do I really want to tell this? Isn't this too private or too weird or something? Or is this really what was meant? So you have to judge as an interviewee, you have to judge the answer. And then in the end, you have to formulate an answer. And all this could go wrong. Anywhere, things could go wrong. So as an interviewer, you should give the space and possibility to an interviewee to do this, to take these steps. Very often, a distinction is made between two types of probes, directive and non-directive probing. And this is an important distinction. For directive probing, you give the interviewee direction. I want you to talk more about this very specific element. And very often you do this because the information is incomplete. For instance, someone has been talking about how friends turned into acquaintances and, or touched upon it. And you as an interviewer want to know more about it. Well, then a directive probe is a probe like this. Can you explain why those friends turned into acquaintances? So you direct the interviewee. In a non-directive probe, you don't do that. You give the floor, the opportunity to the interviewee to wander about, wander around, to give his or her own answer. Like posing the question, can you explain that? Or, oh, continue please, or simply humming. Obviously, this is less directive than this one because there's a debt here. So, this is not just a dichotomy, it's more of a scale rather than black or white. Another important distinction is the distinction between directive and suggestive uh, probes. And 
again, we have some sort of scales, not so much of a dichotomy. Uh, but if we visualize directive probing like this, meaning you can you give the uh, interviewee a direction, but within that direction, there's a complete scope of possible answers. You can't answer anything, but it has to be on this topic. Whereas in suggestive probing, you only give a limited scope, a limited possibility of answering. So you already give a direction on the content of the answer rather than the answer itself. So what you do here is, for instance, uh, on the example of how do friends turn into acquaintances, you give possibilities like, oh, because you never saw each other anymore or something like that. So you give an answer as an interviewer. So then you're not just directing the topic, but you're directing the content of an answer. And here's an example of this. But let's look at this first. The interviewee says, I was really happy. And then, what do you do then? How do you probe? Well, very indirective, be silent. Do not give away or take your turn, your speech turn. No, just leave the turn with the interviewee. And in normal talk, we take turns, and then this interviewee, if you do not take the turn by just being silent, the interviewee will probably continue talking. So that's a very strong probing technique. Another one is just humming. And there are many, many ways how you could hum. And there are slightly different meanings to those. So you see, it's very non-directive, minimal probe, but at the same time, you could use it pretty directive. Repeating a little bit of a sentence, echoing or paraphrasing it. I was really happy. Happy? Happy? Oh, happy! Another probe is, can you explain that? A full sentence. Another uh, um, a question could be, why happy? What do you mean, happy? So you were happy, just stating it, repeating it and paraphrasing it again. Or this, this little suggestive one. You were happy because you won? I already give a reason here. You were happy because you won. So then the interviewee does not need to think or discuss it anymore. I already filled in the form. So beware of that. So how do we probe? What techniques can we use in order to probe properly? And there's a huge range of techniques. Let's look at this. There's active silence, there's humming, there's echoing. There's a comment you could use, an unfinished question, a question repetition, a request for pro... There are too many. There are way too many. And if you are, as an interviewee, thinking while doing the interview about, okay, what type of probe do I need here? You lose the battle, you lose the game. So let's help you a bit because this is all getting wiggly wiggly when you do an interview. So help you a bit and let's color them in order to make some distinction. And here we see the red ones are more minimal probes. The gray ones here are requests. Requests for elaboration, specification, request for a contrast. Difference between an acquaintance and a friend. That's a request for a contrast. Request for an example. But how do you feel about this? A request for a feeling or request for someone's own opinion. What's your opinion on this then? And these are the really cool probing techniques, paraphrasing or summarizing or reflecting. And very often people forget that these are probing techniques, but they're very useful probing techniques. Paraphrasing or summarizing are really cool probing techniques. Why? Because people tend to forget they are probing techniques. It's not a direct question. It's not humming. No, it's using a mirror. This is what you've said before. And please continue about this. Or did I understood it properly? So you are returning a bit as an interviewer. And it helps greatly in creating a rapport if your summary is correct, because if it's not correct, it will demolish your rapport directly. But if it's correct, it helps you in creating rapport. But at the same time, it offers a mirror. It's a great technique of showing, this is what you told me. Is there anything else we need? 
Um, and the same accounts a bit for a reflection. But a reflection is pretty difficult because then you follow the path of the interviewee and it's more difficult. So this, this categorization helps us seeing that there are minimal probes, there are requests, and there are summaries and reflections. And it was a miscellaneous group. I didn't get it. What did you mean with this? Those are a bit negative ways of probing. And in another lecture, I will say something about that.